So today we are very happy to have uh, Anthony Pullen visiting from CMU. Uh, he's going to talk about problem gravity with lensing galaxies and velocity map. Thank you. I'd like to thank the search committee for inviting me and for Roman for hosting me. I've had a great time so far and I'm looking forward to meeting more of you uh, throughout the next, about today and tomorrow. Uh, and I'm excited to be talking to you about probes of gravity using CMB lensing galaxies and intensity mapping. This is work that I've completed at, um, at McWilliams Center for Cosmology at Carnegie Mellon University. So here is a picture of CMB being lensed by intermediate ma intervening matter and here is a picture of Galaxy Survey, specifically BOSS, and um, I propose using surveys like this CMB lensing in galaxies in order to discriminate between general relativity and alternative models of gravity. Specifically, uh, what we propose is that, uh, excuse me, specifically we propose using, we constructed a formalism of how um, modified gravity would alter signals of CMB lensing in galaxies, and we and after explaining this formalism, I'm going to sh present, uh, excuse me, after presenting this formalism, I'm going to present results using this, using current surveys for how, uh, using current surveys and, sorry, uh, and, we, and in these results, we actually show it, they actually reveal a tension between, um, between general relativity and mod modified gravity based on these results. And so, um, in these, notice that these results are also independent of clustering bias, which generally plagues large-scale structure probes of modified gravity. After presenting these results, we're going to show that future future surveys will increase these, will improve these results even further. And finally, here is a picture of intensity of an intensity mapping simulation, specifically of ionized carbon. And in the end of this talk, I will show how intensity mapping, which is a new way to probe large scale structure by probing unresolved galaxies through the emission, through the aggregate emission. We will show that this could be the best tracer for doing this type of search, specifically for stringently placing, placing constraints on modified gravity. So, the work involving CMB lensing in galaxies was done with Shirley Ho, uh, professor, professor at Carnegie Mellon, as well as two, two graduate students, Shadab Balam and Siu He. And also, the work that involves intensity mapping, this is work that I've completed at JPL with Olivier Dore and Jamie Bach, as well as Alan Litz at UPenn and Su Chi Chang at AJA. So, first of all, why, why are we studying modified gravity? Doesn't, um, doesn't Lambda CDM explain things perfectly well? Well, we know that the cosmic expansion is indeed accelerating. For example, we know from measurements of, the sup of supernova, specifically, um, redshifts and, and, and brightnesses, which are just measures of velocity and distance. We know that if that the, when we plot the points for each of these supernova, um, specifically, we, we know that the, the results are very consistent with lambda ZDM, which predicts cosmic acceleration. And it is not consistent with um, a matter-only universe. We also know that um, if you measure baryonic acoustic oscillations, which is a relic of the early universe that you can see in large-scale structure surveys today, you know that if you if you measure this, these baryonic acoustic oscillations and put them on a plot with redshift, you know that these also fit a lambda CDM universe. So this is strange, of course, as you all well know, because we expect that lar um, we, ex we expect that uh, if there was that we need this extra source of energy, this um, this lambda, if you will, or cosmological constant, in order to explain this. But we have no idea what it is. So the question is, what actually is happening to cause this cosmic acceleration? So here. I show, uh, so one way to picture this is to look at Einstein's equation where this describes the curvature and this describes the energy that makes the curvature causing the gravitational force that we see in, um, that, we, that we see on, in both evidence in the solar system and of course, um, and we look for in cosmology as well. And so one, one way to view this is to change, one way to describe the cosmic acceleration is to in fact change the energy side of the equation or add new forms of energy that can cause cosmic accelerations. So, Co uh, the cosmological constant um, described by a pressure, which is a, a negative pressure related to the energy density that allows you to have a repulsive force that, it, that causes cosmic acceleration. We, this is, this is uh, the vanilla model that fits, all the that fits a lot of the data. Um, if this is the case, um, according to a cosmic microwave background 
measurements. This would, uh, specifically from the Planck satellite, this would be the energy budget of the universe where 70% of the universe is in the form of dark energy. So if we were to detect this, this would be amazing. But as I said earlier, we don't really know what form this, uh, this form of energy takes. So until we do that, we need to think of other alternatives. And so another alternative to think of is possibly that gravity is actually, actually not totally described by general relativity on large scales. And so, the term for the, and so this would involve basically taking the curvature side of the equation or changing gravity. And so there are many, uh, in, in the, all the theories that comprise this explanation are collectively called modified gravity. And so there are many, many uh, theories that describe modified gravity as, um, for one, of course, there's chameleon, gra there's chameleon gravity, which is one of the earlier ones that people have thought of. Um, there are also, there's also um, more, it's also bimetric gravity, which is, uh, which is a type of massive gravity. Uh, and then, of course, there are many others, including Galeons and many that I wouldn't be able to fill on this page if I listed all of them. But the idea is that they vary from GR on large scales, and they also modify perturbations, which determine the large scale structure today. So, um, can we use large scale structure surveys to just tell? whether, you know, which, which, one, which uh, phenomena is the case. Is it dark energy or modified gravity? Well, unfortunately, um, probes that just look at the expansion history of the universe, such as supernova and baryonic acoustic oscillations, are not, do not have enough information alone to tell the difference between these two phenomena, specifically because you're only looking at gravitational effects. I mean, specifically, gravi one, one type of gravitational effect, the expansion of the universe. And so in order to in order to um, tell the difference between these two phenomena, you need to look at a, a different gravitational process in order to uh, in order to explain the difference. And so, what, and so, the growth of structure is the candidate in order to break that degeneracy. Specifically, what I mean by growth of structure is just a measurement of the growth rate, which we parameterize f, and it and it just describes how fast it, or its structure of growing. How fast are the matter initial matter perturbations in the early universe? How fast do they grow to become the galaxies and clusters and filaments that we see today? So here's a picture of what um, the growth rate looks like. So this is in this is in uh, this 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 uh, this is a unitless function of redshift, where of course low redshift is today and high redshift is, um, is is far away from us, uh, getting on to farther farther out into the history of the universe. And when dark energy begins to dominate and redshifts of uh, of around one or so. You begin to you begin to see this deviation from a unit from a unity growth rate, and this is just due to as the universe accelerates, um, the perturbations aren't going to be able to grow as fast because everything is spreading out. Uh, this is uh, one parameterization that people often use for the growth rate, specifically having specifically um, you can show that you you can show that the solution of the growth rate for general relativity can be approximated in a power law related to the, the relative matter density today over omega m to a power gamma where gamma is 0.55 for general relativity. And in many studies, people will actually try to fit for this parameter gamma and see if it's different from the general relativity value. Now, how can we, how can we detect this growth weight? Well, I propose that we use a, a parameter called eg instead to measure the growth rate instead of just using f, which I'll explain more why later. But before I get into that, here is the form for EG, where, where psi and phi are the two gravitational potentials that live in general relativity, uh, the, the metric specifically. F is your growth rate, and delta is your matter over density. Um, you can show that if you reduce this based on Einstein field equations in general relativity, you just get that EG, this statistic, is equal to, again, the relative matter density over the growth rate. Now, what exactly modifies EG? Well, this is important because you want to know what, what properties of general, what uh, modifications of general relativity can actually cause a modification in EG, the statistic you're measuring. Well, so one uh, possibility is anisotropic stress. So in general relativity, um, the, the two potentials phi and psi are equal and opposite depending on your convention uh, as far as the minus sign. However, um, this is not true for, if you, for in general for modified theories of gravity. And so we parameterize this difference by parameter gamma. For uh, another possibility is that you have a weak Newton's constant. Uh, specifically, you can have a Newton's constant that it becomes, that is not just equal to Newton's, Newton's uh, 
Newton's gravitational constant, but it, it, it in fact varies with, with scale k and redshift z um, at large scales. And so this will, cause, this will cause gravity to be affected as well. Not only would it affect gravity directly, but it also affect the, not only would it affect uh, expansion probes, but it would also affect the growth rate as well. And so uh, if for each of these, for each of these uh, modifications, if gamma is not equal to 1, or if g is not equal to Newton's gravitational constant, you get a modification of eg, which appears in this form. And so now, how would this like, look like on a plot? Well, here is a pl color plot of eg as a function of redshift and scale. So um, the previous formalism that we showed for modified gravity as far as predictions for eg, this is work that we've, that we've done in our initial paper with my collaborators. And here are some plots that we produced for how eg varies with redshift and scale. So uh, down here lives the linear, the large scales which behave linearly. Here are smaller scales which behave non-linearly, grow non-linearly. Uh, and in between we call this quasi-linear scales. And so if you see on this plot, EG is, EG is dependent on redshift. Just if, if, for general relativity, EG is dependent on redshift due to the growth rate being varying with, due to the growth rate varying with redshift. And for scale, you see that EG is constant with scale. This is scale independent. Whereas for chameleon gravity, this is not the case um, in, this, in the fact that you now have a scale dependence of EG. And so specifically, what we would like to, and what we would like to do is, is uh, detect, see if we can detect the scale dependence of EG because that would be a smoking gun signal for modified gravity. And that's something we want to search for. So how do you actually measure EG? Well, uh, if you take uh, the expression that we derived earlier and take the Fourier transform of it, you get this form for EG, and um, you can then correlate the top and bottom of this expression with galaxies, and you get um, an EG estimator in this form, where here, these are power spectra, which you can measure by taking correlations of different data sets of large-scale structure. Specifically, this, uh, on the top here, you have a correlation with the Laplacian of psi minus phi, and this you can measure using traces of gravitational lensing. And at the bottom here, uh, you have notice you have the parameter f here, and you can measure this expression using um, using measures of structural growth. And so, the what to, what the point to take from this is that you need measurements of lensing and gravitational lensing and growth in order to probe, lar e.g., using large scale structure. And it has to be the same range of scale. Right, the, the same range of k's. Yes, you will measure this parameter at each value at each value of scale. So, how do we measure growth? Well, we measure growth. You know, the, traditionally, you measure growth using the the galaxy power spectrum. So, in order to describe this, uh, those of you who are on large scale structure people, you start with the parameter. I mean, see, so you start with uh, this uh, this parameter here, delta g, which is just equal, which is equal to the over density of galaxies. So you take the number density of galaxies in a pixel on a location, and you subtract the average number of galaxies over all pixels, and you divide by the average. And so this is zero if the number of galaxies in that pixel is the average value, but if it's over average, you have a positive delta, and if it's under average, you have a negative delta. If you take, if you find the variance of this parameter. Over the over the sky, uh, specifically the Fourier component of this parameter, of this delta g, then you get what's called the galaxy power spectrum, and so this is just a variance. This is just described as a variance of the number density of galaxies on the sky, and so this is measured using galaxy surveys. Specifically, this is the latest measurement from the, from the latest the latest public measurement from the BOSS from the BOSS survey, which is part of the Sloan Digital Sky Survey. Um, and so the fluctuations on the largest scales live here, the fluctuations on the smallest scales live here. And so notice that um, if you, so notice that this is an isotropic measure in the sense that it only depends, it only depends on the wave number of, this, of, the, of the fluctuations. It only depends on the size, the, the size of the scales that are being probed. However, this is not, the, however, this is not actually true in a complete sense, because um, you, this, you can actually have an anisotropic power spectrum if, if due to line of sight velocity. Specifically, if structure is growing, and you know you, um, you have and you have a, and you have a distribution of galaxies, those galaxies will not just be influenced by by the cosmic expansion of the universe. They will also be 
influenced by, um, by each other. The galaxies will attract each other. And this is a source of this growth of structure, um, this, this uh, second process of gravity that we're, gra gravity that we're probing. But these um, line of sight velocities will cause an anisotropic power spectrum in the sense that you will have not just a monopole power spectrum, but you will have multipole power spectrum. Specifically, specifically what's shown here is, um, is a plot for how the different multipoles, specifically the monopole, the, quadru the quadrupole, and the hexadecapole, or L equals 2, L equals 0, L equals 2, and L equals 4. This, shows how, this plot shows how these multiple moments vary with the growth rate, F. And so as you see here, even the monopole, this solid blue line, is, in, is, all, is influenced by the growth rate, but also the quadrupole and the hexadecapole are also influenced by the growth rate. And specifically, they're non, the only reason why they're non-zero is because you have this growth of structure, because these galaxies are attracting each other, causing line of sight velocities. And so with these, um, with these measurements of multipoles, you can actually constrain gravity because if you can use the multipole, because basically you can use the multipoles, specifically the monopole and the quadrupole, in order to constrain the growth, of rate, the growth rate. And the growth rate is influenced by the, the true model of gravity. And so this is what people actually try to measure. Specifically, um, because these line of sight velocities actually affect the power spectrum through measurements of redshifts, these are called redshift space distortions in the sense that the redshifts of the galaxies are distorted due to these line of sight velocities. So how does this actually look like in measurements? Well, what you actually measure, is, unfortunately, is not the growth rate itself. But what you measure is this parameter beta, which, all, which is also called the redshift space distortion parameter, or RSD parameter. So this, uh, measure, this parameter beta is equal to um, the growth rate divided by BG, which is a clustering bias. The clustering bias is a parameter that relates number density fluctuations in galaxies to to uh, matter perturbations, and the reason why it is not equal to why BG is not equal to one, is because galaxies are a bias tracer of of large scale structure because they just tend to live in in high density regions specifically. So you can measure um, specifically you can you can use the correlation function in order to measure these parameters, and what you find is that um, your what you can in fact measure is B sigma eight and F sigma eight, and this is these are the latest results by my collaborator Shadab Alam using BOSS data for the BOSS collaboration. And what you find is that um, this, F sig this F sigma 8 here, where sigma 8 is just a, a parameter describing the initial fluctuation, matter fluctuations in the early universe, you actually find that this is a, um, you actually find that this is a, this is degener this F sigma 8 is degenerate with B sigma 8. So now what you have is that your growth rate is degenerate with clustering bias. And it is also, in fact, degenerate with sigma 8 as well. So, what's, so, uh, so this is, so normally what has to be done is you have to marginalize um, your growth rate over clustering bias of sigma 8 in order to measure the growth rate. But this is not a problem for EG because the way e, EG, the statistic I discussed a few slides ago, is constructed, it is independent of clustering bias and sigma 8. And so you can, you can probe gravity directly without worrying about these degeneracies. The other large scale structure trace you need is gravitational lensing. So um, in your general relativity 101 course, you know that not only are particle paths distort, um, geodesics distorted by massive objects due to gravity, but also photon paths are also distorted due, 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 because, of, because of gravity. And specifically, we can use these distortions of photon paths in order to trace large scale structure. It is a, and, and it is, and it is a useful trace of large scale structure because it's not, it's not, uh, it's, it's not directly dependent on the galaxies like, a ga like in a galaxy survey, but you're actually probing the dark matter density which, um, through, large, through this lensing effect. And so it is a two dimensional uh, measurement on the sky and some Types of gravitational distortions that people measure are one of them is lensing conversions. Specifically, lensing conversions describes how photon paths are are, um, are 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 compressed together or expanded out farther apart. And you can see that in this graphic here, where the green circle is the original shape of an object on the sky, and these these black circles show how that image is distorted um, due to either a negative convergence or a positive convergence. 
Also, um, you can, another way to measure the distortion is through measuring the shear or tangential distortions. And this, uh, and this looks like this picture here where you, have, where you gain an ellipticity to the image just due to just due the shear distortions. So how is this statistic e.g. Measure, measure, uh, specifically how has it been measured in the past? Well, um, it's, mainly, it's been measured only use, before only using galaxy lensing. Specifically in galaxy lensing, you have a set of background galaxies here which whose shapes should be uncorrelated and then they're distorted due to foreground galaxies and so in the image you, you process you actually have correlated shapes and this is due to the shear distortions that you can actually measure using imaging surveys or photometric surveys. Here, are, so here, are, here, is, here is the first measurement of EG using galaxy lensing. Uh, specifically, um, most, the measurements used to constrain GR are between 10 and 50 megaparsecs. Um, this has been ex extended to even smaller scales um, um, recently by Chris Blake using, using data from, the, from CFHT, um, sorry, sorry, the CFH telescope. And notice that the largest scales probed here are about 50 megaparsecs. However, we propose that instead of using galaxy lensing, you could, you could, you could use uh, CMB lensing in order to probe this statistic EG. Specifically, just like photons from background galaxies, photons from the CMB will also be distorted due to gravitational lensing. Uh, the lensing convergence can be measured um, on using, using maps of the cosmic microwave background, and then you can use this in order to, propose, in order to probe the integrated matter density all the way out to the last scattering surface of the, of the CMB. So all the way out to the first few hundred years of the, few hundred thousand years of the universe. So this paper, or our paper specifically, was the first paper to propose using CMB lensing in order to measure this statistic to constrain, to constrain gravity. So here we state the advantages of CMB lensing over galaxy lensing as a probe of EG. For one, it is precise, well-defined, it has a precise, well-defined well source plane. We know the redshift of the CMB is 1100. It's very precise. Um, compared, well, specifically compared to gravitational um, lensing background galaxies, which are used, which are measured just using imaging data. And so the redshifts from from these uh, from these studies will are very uncertain. And so they will affect the the measurements that you actually make for lensing. Secondly. The, the redshift of CMB is very high. Um, you're not limited by the redshift of the background of the background source, unlike in unlike in galaxy lensing, where the background galaxies are right now are around redshifts of 0.7, maybe out to one. Um, and we hope to in galaxy surveys like Euclid hope to get out to redshift of two, uh, or two two and a half. And so uh, we're and so they're indeed limited in redshift in a way that the CMB is not. Finally, you don't have intrinsic alignments. So um, one thing that I didn't say in my earlier pictograph of, of galaxy lensing is that you actually, that, that the background galaxies are in fact correlated before lensing takes place. And this is just due to tidal forces in, um, in, in amongst, amongst, the different, amongst the different galaxies that cause, that cause intrinsic alignments. And so the relevant, um, the, re the relevant distortion for CMB lensing would be if there was uh, non-Gaussianity in the CMB measurements, which we already know from measurements of CMB by the Planck satellite to be very low. And so with that, we don't have to worry about intrinsic alignments for the CMB, as well as uh, shape noise because, uh, because of inherent ellipticities like, like is present in normal galaxies. So how do we measure EG using CMB lensing specifically? Well, we take this expression involving the two power spectra, and we integrate these, the top and bottom along the line of sight, and we get this estimated for EG, specifically dependent on um, these, these uh, two um, correlations, which we call CL. CL is, is what's known as an angular power spectrum, so it's like the P of K, the three-dimensional power spectrum that I expressed earlier, except it's a variance on the sky. It's a variance of fluctuations on the sky instead of in three dimensions. But that's the only difference. And also, it is parameterized by L, where L is, um, is, just relates to an angular scale on the sky. So for large angular scales, you're going to have small L and vice versa. So specifically at the top, you have a cross-correlation between a lensing, the lensing field from the CMB and the, and, and the galaxy distribution. And in the bottom here, 
you have your measurement of redshift space distortions, this parameter beta, and you have a measurement of the galaxy autocorrelation. And finally, you have this other parameter here, um, lambda, I mean, sorry, gamma, which is just a, which just depends on the redshift distribution of the galaxies and the lensing response of the CMB as a function of redshift. So, so that, that, yeah. that quantity must have some redshift dependence of all these things built into it or something, right? Right. So you're going to measure this quantity at, at, a, at specific redshifts. And, and you're going to... Um, and you're going to compare, and, it's, and, you've, and you're going to compare that with what you'd expect from from uh, general relativity. Okay, and the, but you can control the redshift by because you're controlling the sample of galaxies that you're crossing. Correct. So when you cross correlate the sample of galaxies with the lensing, you're going to okay. get the fluctuations from that redshift. Okay. So now I'll discuss our measurement that we performed using current data. So first of all, we use the, for the lensing field, we use the Planck CMB measurements. So here is a picture of the lensing, of the lensing potential, which describes, which describes this lensing convergence field. It covers 70% of the sky and is reconstructed from temperature and polarization measurements. And many systematic checks were used in order to perform this measurement, including checks for um, point sources, synchrotron emission, dust, as well, and as well as other systematic effects that um, are that are important. Also, um, another another also we use measurement f um, data from the Boss high high redshift galaxy sample, also known as CMAS. So specifically, here is coverage of Boss in the North Galactic Cap and the Southern Galactic Cap. Um, it consists of about 700,000 galaxies, specifically in this high redshift sample. Um, the redshift range for the galaxies are between 0.4 and 0.7. And as far as spectral completeness, it's very high. It's around 97% over, 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 over the sample. And systematics, and in order to deal with systematics such as seeing or, um, or changes in the, in the, prime, in, in, or changes in the, um, in the point spread function for the galaxies as well as stellar contamination, um, each galaxy was weighted, it was weighted based on its response to a specific systematic. And so this was all taken care of in the sample in order to get a nice cosmological sample. So first, I'll show the redshift space distortion measurement. Specifically, we use uh, a Landy's delay estimator to estimate the correlation function. Um, we fit specifically uh, measurements of f sigma eight and b sigma eight um, using u using this correlation measurement. Um, and we, from this, we were able to measure this the RSD parameter beta. And so this is what the res the result we got: 0.4, which, based on the, the the galaxy bias that you would expect from CMAS, this is this is, uh, this, is a, this is a value which you would expect. And notice that we measured this measure beta all the way out to 130 megaparsecs. Here is our measurement of the galaxy angular power spectrum. So this is the galaxies correlated with each, with each other. Um, again, large scales live here and small scales live here. And so um, we measured this, uh, measured this angular, angular correlation using a minimum variance estimator where we fit each of these CLs by uh, using a minimum variance estimator. And specifically, for the model, we constructed, we took care of the nonlinearities by using an in-body simulation, by using in-body simulations in order, to, in order to predict what the power spectrum measurement should be. Um, what we found was, and, and as far as galaxies, we used measurements from CMAS, which predicted how, many, how halos should be populated from galaxies. And this is how we, um, this is how we included the effect of the galaxy population itself into this measurement. And what we find is that the data agrees with the model. Here is our measurement of the lensing galaxy cross correlation. And, as you s and we met used a pseudo CL estimator to measure this correlation, this, this, this cross correlation. And what we find is that it is not actually a good, fi a good fit to the model on the larger scales. Specifically, uh, we, we see here a deviation of around 2.5 sigma. So this def what's interesting is that this deficit is not just seen in, um, in, in our, my measurement, but it's been seen in other measurements as well. Specifically, the Planck CMB map cross-correlated with other galaxy samples other than, other than CMAS. It's also seen a similar deficit. And finally, this uh, has also been seen in other CMB lensing maps as well. So um, a measurement by the DB DES collaboration or Dark Energy Survey uh, a measurement by DES galaxies course correlated with the CMB measurements from the South Pole Telescope have also seen a similar deficit. 
And so what we're seeing here is that this may not be an instrumental signal, but this may be, in fact, either astrophysical or cosmological. We just don't have information enough yet to tell. Finally, here is our measurement of EG using these, these, these measurements that we perform. Specifically, uh, we measure EG in 11 different L bins. And notice on the top here, we, met, we probe EG all the way out to 150 megaparsecs, something that hasn't been done with EG, any EG measurements before, uh, and not with, a lot of, not with much um, gravitational measurements as well. And so specifically, we use a jackknife resampling in order to, in order to um, calculate the errors for this measurement. And what we find is we, if we do find some tension with GR, specifically, uh, again, around a 2.5 sigma deviation from GR due, due totally by the, due, mostly due to the lensing, this lensing deficit that we showed earlier. And so with this, we also find, um, we also test for systematics, and we find a, con we can detect a contribution of about 5.5% about five due to systematic effects, but this is not enough to explain this signal. And so this is, yes. Uh, I got a couple of questions. One, as you go from small scale to large scales, your error bars don't appear to be getting any bigger, even though the sample variance should be getting much larger. Why? Why don't the errors change with scale? Um, so, so to do so a lot of these errors are also due to due to. Um, so we compute these errors doing, using jackknives, and so it's possible that systematic effects could also. Um, be messing with these error bars and so that you don't get a uh, sample variance. We didn't go that far out in, well, you would expect this to get a lot bigger as you start, as you start sampling, as, you, as, you, as you're getting limited by um, just the boss, the boss survey area. So we may have just not, we may have just not hit that point yet. Um, but also, uh, on your prediction, um, this comes from taking a single cosmological model so you have a, an n-body simulation of a single cosmological model in lambda CGMGR and fitting that to the observed CGG. And then you make a prediction for... Uh, so we don't actually fit the... Um, so I just told you to the model with the data in the comparison, but we don't actually fit for the model when we, when we, when we measure EG. So EG is depend, independent of that, of that prediction. Sorry if I'm not answering your question. <laughs> There's a deviation you showed before between yes. the model and the lensing. But this measurement is independent of that. It's, it's independent of the it's independent of the of of the this the measurement is independent of the measured model. I mean sorry, the, the measurement is independent of the model, but it is dependent on the measurement. So right. yeah, okay. obviously. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Obviously. When you say this is driven by the Fact that you have this lensing deficit, right? Yes, that's that's what drives this deficit here. Mm -hmm. So, but if you if you marginalize over allowed cosmo cosmological parameter space, so here is so, blue yeah. So this blue this blue um, this blue curve actually includes the error. That's the prediction for general relativity includes the errors for due to cosmological parameters. Okay. So, what, what you're assuming here for the model is. For this comparison, is that you can use basically linear bias? Is that all the yes, which we did not use. Um, so we do have a. So for most of these scales, it wouldn't be affected by nonlinear bias. Um, for the cases where it would be, we do actually have have a correction using using the in-body simulations. We do have a correction for for nonlinear bias, but it's not a. It, it mostly lives here, whereas most of the signal. Um, where, where is this? Well, as far as the deviation from general relativity, it won't, it won't explain that, because most of the effect is happening. Most of the, the deviation from general relativity is happening at large scales. So. Uh -huh. so one thing to notice here is that again, the first, the first constraints. Oh, the, this measurement is indeed the first constraints for of EG for, for, for scales higher than 100, for scales higher than 50 megaparsecs. In fact, we go. We probe at scales three times as large as what has previously been done with this estimator, and that's great because for galaxy, oh, sorry, for gravity models, you want to probe the largest scales because that's where you, that's where you see a lot of these effects for, for different modified gravity models. So, question: Is general relativity in trouble? 
I don't think not. I don't think quite yet. Uh, a few reasons. For one, um, statistical there are statistical errors in the systematic checks that in the systematic um, maps that we use for checks, and those could be hiding some biases that may be affecting our signal. Also, we expect that um, we can do we can do better uh, we can do better analyses in the future to try to um, remove at least known systematic effects. For example, um, mode projection is a method that I've used in previous analyses where well you um, basically downweight the downweight contaminate expected contaminated modes that could be disrupting your signal. And so we could and so we could do this in future work, however this will require having having frequency dependent um, for, uh, sorry um, individual lensing maps for each frequency band and plank which could which is are not available yet and so if those were to become available, that could be a kind of that could be a kind of check we could do. Also, um, the next data release for Plink, which should be later this year, expects to have expects to do a better job removing um, SZ contamination or Sunyev Zadovich effect. This is the distortion of this cosmic microwave background due to hot clusters, and so this would uh, and so this wasn't done. This, this, this removing this diffuse. Um, contamination wasn't done in the current for the current CMB lensing maps, but this is expected to be done in the future. And so that could and, and SZ in particular could could cause um, uh, sorry could cause a lower um, lensing measurement just due to it being correlated with galaxies, and you're and it's going to cause more more variance in the in the in the temperature fluctuations, which can sort of act as a delensing agent. And so this is something that we'd want to do. Also, finally, um, there are these new maps by Jean-Luc Stark in France, who um, his group claims that these maps are, in, are totally free of SZ contamination. So uh, they haven't produced a CME lensing map yet, but if they were to do that, that would help um, remove these, these problems even further. Yes? So, um, so you're using these lensing potential maps that Planck has you know, generated from the CMB itself, if yes. I understand it, right? Mm -hmm. Is there any advantage to, to doing more of a, a direct correlation between the galaxy sample and the CMB map? Like, instead of going through the, instead of like, so going, yes, going to the power spectrum. The, the, the power. lensing potential, which, you know, assumes statistical properties of the map and then tries to reconstruct the lensing potential. Can you do it just more directly? Well, the problem is that you'd have to take into account all the pro you you have to take into account properties of the galaxy, the density profiles, and things like that if you were gonna try to correlate. Well, I, I mean, mean, you could, but it would be. I just mean like more complicated. if I have a galaxy, like I want to be able to like a single galaxy that's doing some lensing is gonna do something to the you know it's, you'll be able to do galaxy galaxy you'll be like galaxy galaxy lensing right, mm -hmm. but galaxy. CMB lensing right. without this step in between where you generate a lensing potential. Is it possible? Am I, I and what, am what I'm asking making any sense? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah I think. You have, to, you have to remove the, the, the intrinsic CMB part, right? Because that's what this, because that, that, that part, right, the intrinsic CMB anisotropies that do not correlate with yeah. the galaxies will be not. Yeah. Really well, particularly for the large scale effects, it's not going to correlate with individual galaxies. You really need the whole distribution. I mean, it makes sense, but. Okay. okay. I mean, one, one question related yes. to what he was saying is that, I mean, so you're, try, you're trying to argue that doing CMB lensing is better than galaxy. galaxy. At least, in, at least in, many, in many respects. There are some. There are but some. Yeah. That too nice is probably not. Right, so that's that's what's holding it back, and so um, that's the main thing holding it back. So upcoming, but future surveys will get a lot better, as I'll explain in my next in the next few slides. Um, so before I explain this, I'm just going to talk about well, I'm just going to talk about the gravitational models that I forecast for specifically. Although this is just a picture. And, I, and the goal is to be able to do this, do, to, is, is to be able to use this, use this statistic to constrain um, um, either other types of uh, modified gravity models, including massive gravity. But for now, we're going to stick with two, uh, with um, communion gravity, which um, 
it describes it, it basically describes a fifth force um, where where that's dependent on the density. So um, this is useful because large scale structure has been predicted for uh, what what this model should produce. Uh, whereas in a lot of the other more modern models, um, there's still a lot of more work that needs to be done as far as predicting the large scale structure signal. And so um, also uh, for chameleon gravity, it's we parameterize it by mainly by these two parameters. One B naught is just dependent on the, the mass of the chameleon. So it's just that when the chameleon when um, when the chameleon mass is infinite, then you don't have um, then you don't and it's just like GR because you don't have an effect, you don't have a fifth force. Whereas uh, beta one beta one describes the coupling to matter. Uh, F of R gravity, which is one of these very very old modified gravity models. Um, for the purposes of this talk, you can just think of it as in as as chameleon gravity when beta one is equal to four thirds. Um, specifically, here is a, a is a forecast for a spectroscopic survey, specifically for the dark energy spectroscopic instrument or DESI, cross correlated with Planck, which is the which are the purple. I'm oh, oh, sorry, which are the Planck, which are the cyan crosses or the green crosses, and advanced ACPO, the next generation CMB lensing experiment. Um, next generation CMB experiment, which will uh, which will be which is denoted by these purple crosses. Uh, the blue curve is general relativity. The green curve is um, this F of R gravity, and these red curves are cur are chameleon gravity curves for different beta one values. So this is for a spectroscopic survey. So spectroscopic surveys use spectra in order to measure redshifts. It's very precise, but it's expensive to perform. Generally, this is what is needed to perform a redshift space distortion measurement. Because if you have less accurate redshifts, it tends to wash out the signal. So, uh, so because, because of velocity, because galaxies will be put in the wrong velocities, I mean, put in the wrong redshift bin. So, specifically, if you um, this is the signal, this is the expected signal you get, and then if you average over redshifts, you'd expect a, um, an EG measurement of around two percent for using the Planck CMB maps and one percent using the um, using advanced ACPO. So uh, this will be powerful enough to constrain chameleon gravity specifically. Um, not enough, though, for F of R gravity. Are, are there constraints on these things in the lab? These yeah, uh, yeah, they're they're constraints just from just from just from solar system tests and things like that. Oh. Yeah. How, how does that? How's the, what's the interplay of those? Um, the CMB so, can't tell you for sure. I mean, definitely those don't test scales on cosmological scales. So that's really. That's really what you want for in order to probe, probe these models. Um, specifically, oh, sorry. So here is um, here is the same thing, but for a photometric survey specifically for LSST. So in this case, uh, for photometric or imaging surveys, you use measurements of galaxy colors in order to in order to predict what the redshift is, in order to determine what the redshift is. Now this is less precise than a spectroscopic survey, but it's inexpensive to perform. You can, uh, and so this is used to get the measurements of ga of a lot more redshifts for galaxies. And in, and in most of these cases, you actually perform an imaging survey first before you try to take spectroscopy anyway. And so usually you get this for free with many of these surveys, except for LSST, which is just a photometric survey. So um, this, so one one thing about this is that you normally don't measure again. You normally don't measure redshift space distortions with a photometric survey because of uh, because of impreciseness of the redshifts. Um, but this in case uh, there have been much work considering what what the error in a redshift space distortion measurement from an imaging survey would be. And so based on that, we're going to assume um, redshift errors of around eight percent over. Delta Z, delta Z's or delta redshifts of about 0.1, and so when you find this, you actually get EG measurements of around 1% or for Planck or even less with advanced ACPO. Um, advanced ACPO will, I should say, would um, this is this is predictions that we made, and they're based on the idea of advanced ACPO. If, I'm sorry, advanced ACPO actually observing um, is observing half the uh, observing half the sky with um, which is much basically at the at the at the statistical noise level of the current act pole today, which would be really exciting. And so specifically with this to get a measurement of get an idea of how this would actually how well this would actually constrain gravity, think of it as in 
f of r gravity, um, the parameters being lowered by, by two orders of magnitude. And so with this, it'll be much, much better than the constraints we have today on cosmological scales. And we will also be able to, um, and, and so we'll also be able to, and this will also give you a sense of how well we'll be able to, to specifically um, look at other models like massive gravity, which will also probe these types of scale. Yes? So I don't know if I'm, if I'm phrasing the question correctly, but if I imagine, so you quoted this, this two and a half ish sigma deviation from uh, standard GR 's take the central values and hold them constant and I take these improvements mm -hmm. then what would that uh, what would the deviation then be uh, after this these data come in holding just just holding the sort of central values constant in some sense I know it's multiple data points so I'm not quite out of phrase that but, but so yeah I mean these would the, the central values would certainly be ruled out by I mean even yeah be based on based on today's constraints I mean yeah you're you're reducing so I don't know, you can, yeah, I don't know. I know for this, for these models, it's about a couple of orders of magnitude. We haven't done the analysis for massive gravity. Oh, no, 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 I just mean GR. You said that there's tension with straight GR, right? Just plain GR. Oh, right. So I just wonder, like, how, well, right now, so two and a half. If that were the, if the, yeah, if that were to stay, yeah. then you would, then you're talking about, um, you're going from, basically you're going from 20% measurements to, to in this case, I mean, 1% or less, which obviously this would involve a lot of, Improve, have to involve a lot of improvements on systematics, of course. But if that were to actually stick, um, then then yeah, you're talking about ruling out GR by I guess 20 or like 20 sigma or something like that. So, <laughs> which it seems like statistical, statistic, I mean, systematic errors would, would I'm sure reduce that somewhat. And I'm not terribly again, I'm not terribly confident that that's going to stick. But if it were, that's that's what the case would be. So. In short, uh, imaging photometric surveys uh, are performed spectroscopic surveys. Both would be useful. Um, however, this depends on being able to actually measure redshift space distortions in a photometric survey. So, specifically, um, some of the things I'm thinking about doing. Those things, plan, my plans for the future are one, improve, do the, improve these measurements by performing them using upcoming surveys, like combining Desi galaxies with advanced ADPOL. Um, also. Um, I want to consider how well we can measure RSD with a photometric survey. One problem to think of is catastrophic redshift errors, where, red, where you have galaxies with redshifts are totally different than the redshifts you expect. And so this could plague your sample. And so that's why, this is, it's, it's, that's why it's not really determined whether measuring redshift based distortions with an imaging survey will actually work. But this is something that I, that I would be working on. Also, um, also, you can, com you can consider combining CMB lensing with galaxy lensing. And of course, thinking about what, what, measurements, what um, constraints on other models of gravity, like mass of gravity, will be possible with EG. So, uh, alternative probes. Well, yeah, can, can yes? So, so on, on your graph, on that 2.5 sigma deviation from GR, yes. look to me that uh, it starts too soon. Uh, would you say that at 100 megaparsec you already uh, would claim that deviation or not? So that it because it's graph. so it's um, the the deviation does get smaller as you as you use less of the larger larger scales, um, sure. but but even at 100, um, it's less than two. It's it's um, it's about a, it's about a two sigma at that point, so. That I would argue you shouldn't trust. Right. <laughs> right. Because that, that's too soon, right? right? So if that were the case, in, in theory, Sorry, it's too soon based, based on, on what? Too small scale? Or? Too small scale. Okay. Sorry. But based on what? Well, you would get different cosmology already at that scale. Huh? You would get different cosmology already at that scale. Either, either you would have an agent, like a scalar field, with that kind of mass, but then it has nothing to do with cosmology. It just gives you extra force. That's it. Mm. And that's what you are seeing. Or if you want to explain dark, or you accelerate the accelerate universe through the same theory, then that's that too short scale, yeah? mm -hmm. because you, you would modify cosmology at that scale. Mm -hmm. So that, that's what I'm saying. Yeah. So that's something. That, yeah, that's something to consider. Maybe that may be, that would be an argument for some kind of systematic effect that we need to work to understand, which is something, which is something that I'll be looking at as as data gets better. So. Uh, Okay, so moving on. Um, so much of this work involves looking at how we're limited by galaxy surveys. Specifically, um, 
The galaxy surveys have tended to be a marriage between those who wanted to study individual galaxies and those who wanted to study large-scale structure. Uh, specifically, uh, the, you know, like those who wanted to study star formation, like um, lines for individual galaxies and, and things like that, and maybe in some cases even, and now we're looking at even studies like, the, uh, surveys like W first, which is partially going to look for exoplanets. And so with, when you want to look at individual galaxies, uh, well, of course that's in our solar system, that's not really a, a big effect for but, but the point is that you're looking at, you're looking at objects with, with very precise angular resolutions. And so when th if that's what you want, you normally have to choose between having, the cosmologists have to, produce, have to choose between having either precise redshifts or um, either precise redshifts or high number densities. You normally can't have both. And so what's the case if you actually want both of those and you don't really care about the individual galaxies? Well, that's is why you want to use a new pro, which is called, known as intensity mapping. Here is a um, simulation of intensity mapping again for C C ionized carbon, which I showed earlier. And the idea is to use the, emission, the aggregate emission from galaxies as a whole in order to probe large scale structure. Specifically, um, it works just like a CMB probe in that you're seeing fluctuations, but you're not detecting the individual galaxies. You're detecting the total fluctuations. But this allows you to probe structure on large scales. And so, with this, um, um, this is. Much work has gone into this um, as far as what questions it can answer, and it's very applicable across cosmology, specifically studies of inflation, dark energy, and reionization, and even um, and even star formation studies like looking at molecular lines, probing the gas around galaxies, um, and even um, dark ages. Because you're not again, you're not detecting individual galaxies, but you still you still um, Viewing large scale structure, and you're seeing, and you're getting a measurement of the of the emissions of galaxies on large scales. So this is so basically again, you're sacrificing angular resolution in order to get a um, in order to probe large scale structure. Um, you're getting precise redshifts. You're getting um, you you're, you're having very high sampling rate, so it helps with completeness. Um, different lines are used. The most well known is 21 centimeter line. Um, and uh, which probes neutral hydrogen in an intergalactic medium. Um, there are also star forming lines like CO, C2, and Lyman alpha lines, of which I've, I've worked a lot as far as studying what their emission, emission signals would be. Also, uh, this was great. one of the cool things about intensity mapping as well is that um, you're going to be able to probe much higher redshifts than you can normally do now with galaxy surveys, because galaxy surveys are. I, um, right now, the ones we're planning to build are limited to less than less than redshifts of three. Um, we may get up we may get up to a redshift four one day in the far future, but we're not going to go past that anytime soon. And so, uh, whereas this will allow you to look in the redshift six, which this this is the region where you start probing reionization, the original reionization of the intergalactic medium due to stars, and you can all and and so this will be very useful for upcoming large scale structure surveys. So um, this was one measurement I did where, um, with collaborators Olivia Dore, Zuchi Chang, and Adam Litz, we const reconst uh, I constructed models of CO emission at, lo at lower redshifts, specifically redshifts between between zero and three. Um, this is one. This is the pe this side, this vertical this horizontal line here. Believe it or not, is actually just a pessimistic model. Um, compared with the errors, it looks just looks like a horizontal line. This uh, dotted line up here is, your, uh, is our optimistic model. And this is 10 times the optimistic model. And so what these measurements show, which is, which is based on a cross-correlation between WMAP, which since it's a, when CO is a microwave line, you'd, since it can emit in a microwave at least at higher redshifts, you can expect to see in WMAP. Um, you already expect to see evidence for it in WMAP. Cross, um, we cross-correlated those signals with quasars. And what we find is that um, basically, what we at least rule out this, so we know that we're on the right track as far as the modeling. And um, this was followed up by measurements um, from the COPS survey, which uses data from the Karma from the Karma spectrograph. And so what we find here is that um, here is the, the limits determined by the COPS survey, which also measures CO emission in an intensity mapping manner. And what we find here is that my optimistic model is now starting to get ruled out, but my pessimistic model is still here. 
and um, and it'd be good to extend these search with more extend these results with more searches. Sorry, what, sorry, just remind us again. What's the pessimistic and optimistic? In which way? Like so this is the this is the optimistic and this is the pessimistic. Sorry, but what's the physics? Sorry. I'm so the physics is the uh, optimistic model. Well, the pessimistic model uses um, uses predictions of the star formation rate um, combined with uh, measurements of the CO luminosity CO luminosity far infrared luminosity ratios. And the optimistic model predicts more because it's using the star formation rate density. So it's, a lumino it's like a luminosity function, but it's for star formation rates. And so for some reason, that tends to predict a higher signal than uh, what you'd expect. Although it may not be, um, at least for the redshift it was measured at, it's, it's, pro it's not representative of, it's not well, it's not necessarily representative of, uh, of the signal at these higher redshifts. And I think that's what we're finding out here. <laughs> okay, uh, what about other lines? So C2 is a thousand times brighter than CO, and so we'd expect that to be a good candidate for first detection. And here is some work on, this is what I'm working on now, where I cross-correlated Planck high-frequency maps with BOSS quasars. And what I find here is, um, is it looks like a power spectrum. It's, a, it's about a 20, um, I want to say a 20, uh, 20, it's about 24 sigma detection of this power spectra on these scales, uh, it's where we stop here because these we think are just, non, it's just due to nonlinear clustering. Uh, specifically, this is the intensity we measure, which is about three times larger than the optimistic model for ionized carbon emission. However, these things are pretty uncertain, so it could be true, but we're also still performing systematic checks, uh, specific, um, looking at different systematics um, to see if they could be causing this correlation as well with galaxies. And so, more work needs to be done, so this is really still pretty preliminary. Um, here is a list of different surveys that will be online in the future. So these are all the 21 centimeter surveys. Uh, specifically, um, some upcoming ones are CHIME, which is, currently being which is currently being constructed and should detect the BEO signal from 21 centimeter. Um, and then, of course, there's Meerkat and SKA, which will be coming online in the future. Um, there's also uh, CoMap, which I've been involved with in the past, which is a CO mapper, which is being, um, which is being constructed right now at Stanford. Um, well, specifically, the spectrograph is being constructed at Stanford. Um, there's Time Pilot, which will hopefully detect ionized carbon emission. And finally, there's SphereX, which I'm a, I'm a part of the collaboration for SphereX. And what this, what this is doing, this wants to map Lyman Alpha all the way out to the reionization redshifts. And so this could be. This is possible according to models that I've constructed of Lyman alpha emission, and so um, and, and as far as forecasts that I've conducted uh, that, that, that I've constructed, and so this would be very exciting if this were to happen. Um, also in SphereX, there is also uh, FNL studies using for low using low resolution spectroscopy, and so this is a pretty exciting survey. Right now, it's in the right now it's competing against two other proposals for funding, um, and I think we have a really good shot at beginning funding. So what does all this have to do with gravity searches? Well, so intensity mapping is really an ideal probe for measuring EG as well, specifically because it has very high sampling, as well as, uh, as very high sampling, as well as um, good spectroscopy. And so you really get the best of both worlds. So you don't have to worry about this, again, this tension between having precise redshifts and having, and high, having high number densities. Here is a forecast done by, um, let's say, Alexis Porcidu. And um, this past year, looking at um, how, S, how, how well SKA will be able to measure EG, particularly if um, 21 centimeter lensing is included, um, which of course is pretty far out there. But if that were the case, that would be you would get um, errors much less than one percent, um, and so this would be pretty exciting to probe. And you would, and it's, it would, you would, you would have even better probes on um, on gravitational on gravitational deviations from GR, and so this would be very exciting to perform. So as far as what projects I would want to do with intensity mapping, for one, um, measuring EG using upcoming surveys like, well, like COPS, COPS now, but in particular um, probes like uh, CHIME and, and like CHIME and SphereX would also be ideal probes for these types of measurements because you're having, because it, particularly for CHIME and SphereX because you're having much larger areas and you um, and so that should allow you to get percent level measurements if the noise, if if the systematics were able to be controlled for. And one another part of my 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 research would also be determining systematic um, 
determining strategies for getting out the signal to reduce systematic effects. And that will also be very important for these types of surveys. Um, in particular, if you use multiple studies over multiple lines, that creates synergy because you're looking at, um, this, you can look at the same redshifts but in different regions and frequency space, and that also allows you to reduce systematics as well. And, something, and so that's something that I'll also attempt to do as in my research. So in conclusion, um, CMB lensing is a, very, is a very exciting probe for specifically you're looking at constraints, constraints of gravity over very large scales. Um, so we found some tension with GR, but greater precision is needed in order to determine whether it's actually a signal or if there's some systematic effects, um, as we talked about. Also, um, with upcoming large areas of the galaxy surveys like, like DESI or LSST or Euclid, they can, we could extend these studies even further. And of course, with intensity mapping, um, as that word, as that would, as that comes off the ground, that would also um, that would be, in particular be the best possible tracer for these types of studies. So again, more work needs to be done. Predicting what EG would be for um, for mass of gravity or, or, or for mass of gravities like uh, like bimetric gravity or Galileans or different models like that would also be very important to perform um, as well. Before uh, conducting, seeing if we can measure. I mean, Seeing if you can measure photometric redshift space distortions would be useful. Um, testing for, uh, and then, then doing different tests for systematic effects will also be something that I want to be a part of, that, that I'll also be performing in my future work, you know, of leading, that, leading that effort as well as um, considering strategies for intensity mapping for many studies, for many types of studies, including these types of measurements. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Those are just models that predict how much of CO emission we should see. Yes. Um, yes. So you mentioned a, lot, a number of times systematics, and of course that's always a very important concern for any kind of uh, um, any kind of probe. So can you just go into detail about what you think is the worst kind of or the most uh, important kind of systematic that you would be wanting to look into? So which, for which probe? Any, your favorite one. Oh, my favorite. <laughs> Just choose. Well, I don't really have a favorite systematic, mm -hmm. but... <laughs> no, not a favorite, but the worst systematic for your favorite probe. Um, so, <laughs> probably, uh, so, I don't know if it, well, for, intensity mapping is, would be my favorite, well, intensity mapping would be my favorite probe. Obviously, I've been, it's only just now beginning to be done, but, uh, I think, uh, I think dust is a, is a, is a, is a big part because you're going to expect to see you, you're going to expect to see du you're going to you're going to expect to see dust uh, emission, which would uh, which would just totally which would totally screw up your sample because it's not it's it's, uh, it's correlated in weird ways and so that's one way to detect it. But also, if you're not looking for it, it could be a huge problem. Also, to um, I think interlopers is also an issue because particularly for intensity mapping, you're going to you're going to get everything. You're not just going to get a signal at one redshift. You're going to get signals at at many, at many redshifts, and so teasing all that out, um, particularly for some of these star forming lines like CO and C2, where you're not isolated in spectral, in, in, in your spectra like you are with 21 centimeter, it's going to definitely be a challenge. And so, uh, um, but statistical methods could, could, be, could be done to do, it, do use this by, number one, if you're using cross correlations, that helps. Um, and also, you, um, and also possibly using the cross correlation even to see how contaminated signals are and maybe even by statistical methods able, being able to remove um, large patches from different redshifts that you can identify with statistical methods that would also be that also be useful. Mm. So for, for this result that you showed of course correlating blank with uh, the post results. Mm -hmm. So what do um, well, actually, we did more of the work with the. Sorry, we did more of the work with the maps, not the. I mean, the the, the temperature maps, not the quasars. But uh, well, the quasars. So we used uh, so so Adam. So we used so we used spectroscopic sample, and there's a very. You have to take into account the sampling because it's not actually it's not it's really it's it's not really trivial. So 
See, Adam Myers, who's a collaborator on Boss, has, has developed a code in order to be able to pick out a, a what, did, what did it say? Uh, in order to pick out a, a, a uniform sampling of the quasars in the correct manner. And so that's the code I use in order to get a, get a uniform sampling. Is that your question? Yeah. I guess, it, yeah, it's pretty basic, my question. So, what's, so that's a power spectrum of cross correlation of. Quasars with the Planck maps. Yeah, yes. but what, what does that mean? You take the temperature. So we of take the Planck high frequency. Planck and you take what of both? So we use the. the well, yeah, it's so it's, it's, it's the over density. So, so we yeah. take the we take the quasars from a uniform sampling, which was uh, again constructed using the code from Adam Myers, and we take that and we uh, we take that and we construct that. Over density. Well, it's, you yeah. So you you are measuring the you are measuring the intensity in which you're not. Um, well, the intensity mapping signal is not the quasars. The intensity mapping signal would be. Will be Planck specifically because you're not you're not looking at a spectral distortion in the CMB or anything. You're actually looking for you're actually looking for emission from low redshift galaxies that are that are producing I that are producing see. correlations. I see. So basically, the cross correlation you're picking up is the unresolved galaxies that contribute to the CMB. That will, that that will to, the, to the to the to the Planck maps. Yes. 